All right. My name is Jennifer von Esdorf, and I am the Democrats Abroad State Teams Coordinator, and I am so thankful that everyone could join us today to hear from these phenomenal candidates. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, Democrats Abroad is the largest group of U.S. citizens outside the United States organizing together, and we are also an official arm of the Democratic Party. It is our mission to provide Americans abroad a voice in our government and, of course, to elect Democratic candidates by mobilizing the overseas vote. As you all know, there is so much at stake this year, 34 U.S. Senate seats, all 435 U.S. House of Representative seats, 46 state legislatures, and 36 state governorships are up for grabs. Offices where the decisions that impact your and your family's day-to-day -day lives are made. Offices where decisions on climate justice, reproductive rights, affordable education, and healthcare, and so much more are made. Please. Be a part of this year's decision and request your ballot at votefromabroad.org. You need to do this every calendar year. So if you haven't yet, do it today. With less than 60 days until the 2022 midterms, we have set out to bring the elections and the issues closer to you so that you know who and what is on the ballot and so that lawmakers stateside know about issues unique to you and to their overseas voters. In this vein, I would like to thank our Maryland state team for organizing today's Meet the Candidate event, and especially all of the candidates who were able to join us. We welcome you to today's discussion with these outstanding Maryland Democrats running in the November midterm election. We're looking forward to doing all we can from abroad to see the candidates get the support of our DA Maryland members. We also want to we also want to support the Maryland Dems as they fight to defeat Dan Cox and Michael Peruca and unseat Andy Harris and keep Maryland blue. Remember to participate in the 2022 elections. You can request your ballots at www.votefromabroad.org. Our panelists today include leaders from several DA groups. We'd like to thank our Global Black Caucus, the, the Global Hispanic Caucus, the Global Veterans and Militaries Family Caucus, the Global Women's Caucus, and the Taxation Task Force. We also welcome the Maryland State Team Lead, Beth Landry, and the Marylanders Abroad team. Beth, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Welcome, and thank you for joining wherever you're signing on from. My name is Beth Landry. I live in Sweden, but I was born, raised, and earned my nursing degree in Salisbury, Maryland. It's my pleasure to serve DA as the Maryland State Team Lead. Shortly, you will hear from several Maryland candidates. But first, I want to emphasize how important it is for Maryland voters to take action early and vote. In 2020, over 27,000 Marylanders, Marylanders requested a ballot, which is 6,000 more than returned one. This goes to show how crucial it is that Marylanders living outside the US can make their voices heard both by requesting and successfully returning their ballots from overseas. That said, I have some important voting information to share with Maryland voters who are in attendance. So I will go ahead and Give me one second to share my screen. So, oh, one moment. So for some important voting information for Maryland voters, first of all, please do note, we must return our ballots by postal mail. Ballots are gonna start going out to voters on September 24th. So not very long from now. When you get your ballot, you wanna fill it out and mail it back right away. If you don't get your ballot, when ballots start going out, you wanna contact your local election official in the county that you vote in by email or by phone to make sure that they will send you yours. You can see the link here to look up their contact information at votefromabroad.org backslash states backslash Maryland. You can also check your voter registration on the Maryland voter lookup page, and we can share that link in the chat. Additionally, important information when it comes to registration and ballot return, the ballot, or sorry, the registration deadline is on Tuesday, October 18th. Ballot request deadlines, as you can see, are on the screen. Um, note that if you request by email or online, fax or postal mail, those are three or two different dates with uh, two different times for November 1st for requesting your ballot by fax 
and if by postal mail if you need to. Ballot return deadlines, it must be postmarked by Tuesday, November, November 8th and received by your election office on two, or sorry, November 18th before 10 a.m. So those are some important dates and we'll reiterate this again a little bit later for those who might be hopping on uh, towards the end of the call. But I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing that. Please do keep that in mind. And uh, one more thing before we start talking um, or introduce our candidates, the DA Maryland state team is not only committed to getting out the 2022 overseas vote, but we're also planning ahead for legislative advocacy to make voting from abroad easier for all Marylanders who are voting from overseas. We need all the help we can get, and we'd love to have you join us next Monday, September 19th for our organizing meeting. We're saving a seat at the table for you. Will you take action with us? And that link for that uh, event page should be popping into the chat shortly. And without further ado, we can go ahead and introduce our first of today's candidate speakers. I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to Jazz Moore. <laughs> Thank you very much, Beth. Honorable Congressperson uh, Brown, on behalf of the Global Black Caucus and myself, I first and foremost thank you for your military service and of course to the service to our country. Being born in a military family and growing up on Ramstein Air Base in Germany, I appreciate your dedication in rooting out extremism in the military. And looking at your website, the first sentence that jumped out to me was a phrase that I always use as well, how can I help? Anthony's career in public service began as a lieutenant in the US Army as an aviator and a JAG officer. He deployed to Iraq and received the Bronze Star. Since then, Anthony has spent three decades as an attorney and has served faithfully in the Maryland House of Delegates as a Lieutenant Governor and in the United States Congress. Anthony has been a leading voice on equity and justice both in Maryland and on the Capitol Hill, including working to root out extremism in the military, fighting to protect families by reforming gun safety laws, and being a lead sponsor of the George Floyd Justice in po Policy, Policy Reform Act. He is, he is running for attorney general to continue that work and dismantle barriers within, uh, whether in healthcare, housing, the environment, or the workforce, and give every Marylander a fair shot to get ahead. Congressperson Anthony Brown, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Jazz. Uh, thanks for your leadership. Thank you for the kind introduction. Beth, I also want to thank you uh, for all of your efforts to uh, sort of galvanize um, you know, Democrats abroad, uh, Marylanders, uh, and encouraging, inspiring them, uh, educating and informing them on exercise and that most fundamental right uh, that, uh, you know, we in the United States uh, enjoy, uh, all too often take for granted, uh, while communities around the world, many of uh, which you may live today, uh, don't enjoy the same freedoms that we enjoy today. I have a, a personal uh, sort of experience uh, with Democrats abroad in that my very first election uh, in 1998 um, to the Maryland House of Delegates, uh, and this was back when, uh, you know, there were absentee ballots, we not, now call it mail-in uh, ballots, uh, but absentee ballots, and the vast majority of those were uh, cast by um, uh, Marylanders living abroad. Uh, on election night, uh, I was losing the race uh, and it was the absentee ballots. Again, the, I think the majority of them came from abroad uh, where I ended up winning the race. And I remember back then making sure I said to my campaign, let's make sure that we send out mail uh, to Marylanders living abroad and not just to uh, addresses here in Maryland. So, um, and I appreciate all the uh, Marylanders living abroad for your continued interest in our elections, both at the state level um, and uh, at the federal and, and the local levels. So it's an honor to be with you today. I am the Democratic nominee uh, for uh, Maryland's Attorney General. Um, and real briefly, because I know we have questions that we're going to get to, and I hope um, that I'll be able to answer uh, as many as uh, are presented or posed. Um, I, have, I have nearly three um, decades uh, as an attorney, um, private practice, 
um, and experiences ranging from a colonel in the United States Army uh, to a three-term member of Congress with a tour of duty uh, of eight years in Maryland's General Assembly uh, and also eight years as Maryland's Lieutenant Governor. And I know through all of these experiences that at this moment in time, Marylanders deserve and are demanding an Attorney General will not just enforce the laws, but will be an advocate for change. Uh, we recognize that in Maryland, we've made a lot of progress, um, but too many barriers exist for too many Marylanders. We see it in education and the environment. Uh, we see it in healthcare and housing. Uh, we see it in the workplace uh, and in policing and the criminal justice system. And many of these barriers are the results of systemic um, racism. Um, and uh, I'm running for attorney general uh, to dismantle those barriers, uh, to join with our governor, uh, Wes Moore, I think you're going to hear from his lieutenant governor running mate, Aruna Miller, to join with the presiding officers, the members of the General Assembly, community, civic leaders, faith and business leaders around the state of Maryland to dismantle those barriers, to make government work again and for everyone, uh, and to advocate and bring about the kinds of changes and reforms that will protect every person and empower uh, every community. Um, you know, as Attorney General, I'll serve as Maryland's uh, Chief Legal Officer. I may represent the state, but I work for the people. Um, so together, we'll investigate issues. Um, we'll um, advocate for necessary legislative change and reform. Um, and I'll set enforcement priorities that are consistent with the people who elect me. So that's true whether we're uh, taking on the rise in crime, which is a big issue today, um, or improving public safety, whether we're addressing climate change, and we're making a lot of progress in that area in Maryland, or addressing issues like environmental uh, justice, uh, whether we're dealing with affordable housing or quality health care, and even defending against attacks on women's reproductive freedoms, uh, whether we're protecting consumers uh, and seniors, veterans, uh, immigrants, and refugees, uh, or voting rights and workers' rights and the rights of the LGBTQIA plus community. As the Attorney General, I'll fight for all Marylanders fighting for justice, holding people accountable, accountable including elected officials uh, and law enforcement to make sure that we have a fair, more equitable state uh, in Maryland, one that we can be proud of, one that we've worked hard uh, to, to bring to this point where we are today, um, and one that I think is going to be uh, the kind of state where future generations will want to live and raise their families. So with that, I'll stop here. Uh, and um, look forward to answering uh, any questions that you have. Uh, thank you very much, Congressperson Brown. Um, you've touched on a lot of the subjects. And before we hand it over to the Global Women's Caucus with Anne Hess, there is a question from the audience that came in. Um, what would the candidates or what would you as a candidate do to ensure the LGBTIQ plus people and families will maintain equal rights uh, in the state of Maryland and also federally? Sure, and look, as a proud uh, parent of a transgender man, um, I have dedicated uh, my life uh, to equity and equality uh, in Maryland and, and on, uh, on Capitol Hill. And that's true regardless of race, faith, ethnicity, gender, um, identification, orientation, because um, I believe that all residents uh, of Maryland, of the United States, all citizens as well, all right, should enjoy the rights and the privileges of living uh, in uh, the United States. As you mentioned on Capitol Hill, I took on the Trump administration uh, against the ban on transgender service members. Um, in Maryland as Lieutenant Governor, um, I uh, led the fight, not alone, of course, working shoulder to shoulder, particularly with my good friend, Jamie Raskin, uh, who we now serve together on Capitol Hill uh, and, bring it, and making marriage equality real in Maryland. Uh, so one of the things that, and one of my top priorities uh, this January, uh, when I present my legislative priorities to the Maryland General Assembly, will be to establish civil rights enforcement authority for Maryland's Attorney General. Today, the Attorney General advises the Maryland Civil Rights Commission. It's an important commission that does good work. But if we're truly going to enforce federal uh, protections and Maryland laws, um, uh, around discrimination and fair treatment, the attorney general has to have the authority to bring those actions. So first and foremost, I'm gonna seek those uh, authorities. I'm gonna ensure that my office reflects the diversity uh, that is Maryland. 
Uh, and uh, with that, I think we're going to be making big strides in ensuring equitable treatment uh, for uh, members of the LGBTQIA plus community. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it over to Anne Hess from the Global Women's Caucus. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for taking my question, Mr. Brown. Well, people attending this call might not know that Maryland recently modernized its approach to abortion access, which required, of course, the Democratic legislature to override a veto from the Republican governor. But there's still more to do. So how would you leverage this victory to expand and protect access to abortion for people in Maryland and to reach out to voters who may be motivated, motivated by this issue? And do you have any advice for us that Democrats abroad on reaching especially those crucial swing voters who might not typically support Democrats? Sure. And Anne, thank you for the, the question. Um, I'm proud of where we are in Maryland. And um, what we are doing to ensure uh, that um, women's reproductive health uh, um, uh, choices and decisions are theirs uh, and theirs alone to make. And they can make it in coordination with their health provider uh, and, um, um, and, and anyone or anything uh, that, they, that they want to. And I think we've made a lot of progress uh, in uh, Maryland. Uh, the General Assembly uh, this session, as you mentioned, uh, did uh, pass legislation that expanded the category of providers that could provide uh, abortion services in Maryland and also appropriated money uh, to support that training. Uh, unfortunately, our Republican governor, Larry Hogan, has withheld those dollars. Certainly, Larry Hogan is term limited, and I, and I expect Governor Wes Moore is going to support the disbursement of those funds. Um, as Attorney General, um, I will um, make sure uh, that uh, the, you, through the opinion and advice function of the office, uh, that we're clarifying that under Maryland law, uh, abortions uh, are legal. When the General Assembly appropriates funds, uh, they should be and will be dispersed uh, in the way that the General Assembly that reflects the will of the people uh, sees uh, fit. Uh, so Maryland's a great state to live. We codified a uh, row back in 1992. The Supreme Court's overturning of row doesn't change the legal status of uh, women's reproductive health decisions uh, and the protections afforded under Roe in Maryland. But we can't be complacent because 50 years ago, we would not have thought that we would be sitting here today um, uh, with a Supreme Court that reversed the first time in the history of this country, a right that had been extended uh, to a group or to, 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 uh, to, uh, to Americans. Um, so in Maryland, the next step is to uh, enshrine in our constitution the protections afforded uh, uh, under uh, Roe versus Wade. Make sure that we're fully funding the services uh, that are appropriate that are, are needed by women in Maryland. And many women are coming to Maryland from states that have imposed restrictions uh, on uh, abortion. So providing services to them uh, as well. And as Attorney General, I'll work with the governor uh, and the General Assembly to make sure that those protections and appropriations are in place. In terms of what you can do, look, the power of uh, social media, uh, the power of um, digital communications, uh, and communicating first and foremost with your network, your colleagues, your friends, your families who are either living or voting uh, in Maryland. This is going to be a defining issue uh, in the November elections. I think that it, you will see um, a, a large turnout uh, in November. Uh, certainly the, the, the motivation, I think, primarily will be to retain the Democratic majority um, in the House uh, and to expand perhaps by one, two, maybe more seats in the Senate. But that increased turnout should benefit office, uh, I should say, candidates in Maryland. It's going to help Westmore. It's going to help Anthony Brown. It's going to help Brooke Learman to expand and also our General Assembly to expand our membership. So that happens when we communicate with one another and you through, um, with the use of technology, uh, should be communicating to uh, your network of, of, of friends and family and colleagues who are voting in Maryland. Okay, thank you. That's very encouraging. Thank you very much, Anne, and the Global Women's Caucus for such an excellent question there. I'm now handing it over. I'm now handing it over to the Global the, um, Veterans and Military Families Caucus, um, represented by Key Evans. Thank you. 
Um, Representative Brown, the DA Veterans and Military Families Caucus honors your military service and your serving in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, DAVMF represents over 1,000 members who are veterans, family members, and allies, and we work to guarantee equitable assistance to all veterans, including the thousands of veterans living overseas. As Maryland's Attorney General, how will you support overseas veterans on issues such as health care, payment of tuition to overseas universities, and timely reimbursement of out-of-pocket expenses? Well, thank you, Keith. Thank you for the question. Thank you to uh, you and our, and our, our veterans and uh, the Veterans Caucus for everything that you're doing to ensure that veterans are staying engaged and informed. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a proud veteran, uh, and what I appreciate so much about the men and women who have served our nation in uniform and their families is that when we take off the uniform, uh, when we render that final salute uh, to the command, uh, we continue to give back and serve our country and our communities in so many different ways. Some people in public service, in nonprofit service, uh, in so many different ways. And that's what excites me uh, and warms my heart about veterans, uh, a lifetime of service. As Maryland's Attorney General, I, I have a consumer protection division. It is the largest division uh, in the office. Um, and that consumer protection division uh, serves another number of functions that are relevant to the issues that you raise. For example, we have a health uh, education advocacy unit that is designed uh, to protect Marylanders, whether you're living in Maryland or abroad, uh, when there are disputes around uh, um, health um, uh, services and when a, uh, an insurer is denying services or around reimbursement uh, and reimbursement uh, rates. Um, so what I need to do as the Attorney General, and this is true uh, in every function that is provided by the Consumer Protection Division, is not only to receive those complaints and those claims and do the necessary mediation or investigation, but the education and outreach. So I've made a commitment during the course of this campaign that my Consumer Protection Division uh, will lean into educating outreach to Marylanders living home and abroad on the services, their rights, and the protections of the Attorney General's office. So that'll be the case, whether it's uh, in the area of healthcare or in tuition reimbursement. Um, Brian Frost has been, that's our current Attorney General, has been very aggressive in protecting students uh, when it comes to predatory lenders and has recovered a lot of money on their behalf. When it comes to for-profit uh, institutions, and I'm not picking on for-profit um, uh, institutions of higher education, but we do see uh, more complaints in that area uh, when they're not delivering uh, on what they promise to students. Um, and there are tools that the Attorney General through the Consumer Protections Division can use uh, to protect Marylanders. And that's true whether you're a veteran or not, whether you're living in Maryland or you're living abroad. Uh, so, and But there, just like with the health advocacy, it's important for the office, the Consumer Protection Division, to reach out and educate um, Marylanders on the rights uh, and the protections uh, that they have in the office. Uh, so we've got to ramp up our efforts in that. They've done a pretty good job over the years, uh, but as a member of Congress who holds town hall meetings every uh, uh, two weeks uh, in my district, uh, I know that often uh, the services uh, the programs uh, available, uh, by, made available and possible by government uh, are unknown uh, to uh, our residents, our citizens, our intended beneficiaries. So you've got to be engaged in outreach and education. Uh, and uh, we'll do that through the Office of the Consumer, uh, the Consumer Protection Division. Thank you so much. And even though I'm not a Maryland voter, I look forward to your election. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Key, uh, from the Veterans and Military Families Caucus for another great question there. And also, thank you very much, Congressperson Brown, for your time, for your commitment. And I do hope for the best outcome during these uh, elections for you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Jazz. All blue in 22.
All blue, a blue wave. <laughs> there we go. Take care, everybody. There we go. Thank you very much. And I would now like to hand it over to Michelle Taub. Michelle. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Tauby, and I am a member of the Maryland State team living in Denmark. I vote in Maryland's 8th Congressional District, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Senator Van Hollen. You can hear me, right? Yeah, okay. Um, Chris Van Hollen was elected by the people of Maryland in 2016 to serve as their voice and their vote in the United States Senate. Prior to that time, he served in the House of Representatives representing Maryland's 8th Congressional District, where he was a member of the House Leadership Team and ranking member of the Budget Committee. He has the unique distinction of being a past chairman of both the House and the Senate Democratic Campaign Committees. Senator Van Hollen has worked tirelessly to push back against attacks on our basic rights and freedoms and worked with President Biden to defend our democratic institutions from those who seek to tear them down. Senator Van Hollen is proud to be a fierce lifelong advocate for Maryland families and working people across our country. He has been a leader in the fight against the corrosive influence of big money in politics and works every day to advance the goal that our democracy lives up to its full promise of equal rights, equal justice, and equal opportunity for all. Throughout his public service, he has led the push to address the threat of climate change and move our country to a more sustainable clean energy economy. As a son of a US Foreign Service officer, Senator Van Hollen spent many of his early years as an American living abroad. He credits this experience with instilling his firm belief in the powerful impact we can have when we are a strong and consistent voice for human rights, diplomacy, and democratic values abroad. As a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he has worked to advance these goals in our foreign policy. Senator Van Hollen is unfortunately not able to join us in person today, but he has recorded a video for this event. Hi, I'm Chris Van Hollen, and I'm proud to represent the great state of Maryland in the United States Senate. And I'm especially pleased to be joining all of you for this event and to support the important work of Democrats abroad to make sure that every American living overseas has the resources and tools they need to vote and that they cast their votes. We may not be standing shoulder to shoulder in the same room, but we are united in recognizing the very high stakes in the 2022 midterm elections and the need to get out the vote and ensure democratic victories in the Senate, the House, and other elections throughout the country. I grew up in a foreign service family and spent a lot of my early years living overseas in Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, Turkey, and traveled to many parts in between. American diplomats spend a lot of time promoting democracy, the rule of law, and human rights abroad. But when you look at what's happening in America today, you know that we must work overtime to defend our democracy right here at home. The January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol and our democracy should be a wake up call to every American that our democracy and our constitution are under threat. And it's our job as citizens to protect them. And that begins with making sure we vote for candidates who are sworn to protect our democracy not for insurrectionists and their apologists. We must defeat the poison of Donald Trump and the big lie. There are less than 60 days until election day. And we know that in the last elections, Democrats only won the majority of the United States Senate by a razor thin margin, 50-50 with the vice president casting the deciding vote. And we only won the Senate because of the Georgia Senate election runoffs on January 5th, 2021, one day before the attack on the Capitol. In 2020, 18,867 Georgians voted from abroad, which not only helped send Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to the White House, but also those votes and those casts by Georgians abroad in the runoffs helped us win those two essential seats, Reverend Warnock and John Ossoff. And there are roughly 27,000 of my fellow Marylanders abroad and 9 million of my fellow Americans serving our country abroad or living overseas for other reasons. Those numbers, all of you, can absolutely make the difference in close elections. And we know these midterm elections are going to be close. So I just ask you to remember the wise words of my dear friend, 
the late, great John Lewis, who said, and I quote, the vote is the most important nonviolent tool we have. So how do you vote? Well, please go to votefromabroad.org and get more information on how you can participate in the election and make sure your voice is heard. The Republican Party is making it crystal clear that they want to make it harder for Americans to vote. They want to win by subtraction, not by addition. We need leaders in the White House and the majority in Congress that want more Americans to participate in our democracy and vote, not less. That's the true essence of having a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. As you know, elections are about choices. As President Biden often says, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And the choice voters face in 2022 could not be starker. If Democrats had not won the White House and the Senate and the House in the last elections, we would not have enacted the American Rescue Plan to beat back the pandemic. We would not have passed the infrastructure modernization bill to make long overdue investments in transit, roads, bridges, broadband, climate change, and more. We would not have passed a common sense gun safety measure as a first step in protecting our communities. We would not have passed the Inflation Reduction Act to cut the costs of Medicare prescription drugs and dramatically boost our investment in clean energy. It also establishes a 15% minimum tax to ensure that big corporations can no longer get away with making massive profits but paying zero taxes. We pass laws to increase our health care protections for our veterans and laws to beat, boost our domestic manufacturing in critical areas and sharpen our competitive edge with the CHIPS and Science Act. And of course, our work finally in tackling the climate crisis. We got it all done even as big, powerful special interests tried to stop us. But the American people were for it. Now we have a lot more work to do to protect fundamental freedoms in this country, like a woman's right to choose, access to the ballot box. We need to pass comprehensive immigration reform, enact legislation to get dark money out of our elections, and make sure we build an economy that truly works for everyone and deliver on the promise of equal rights, equal justice, and equal opportunity for all, building a more perfect union. And the Republicans? What do they stand for? Well, they remain the party that protects the big moneyed special interests at the expense of everyone else. Not one of them voted for the American Rescue Plan or for the Inflation Reduction Act. And the Trump poison has metastasized to make the GOP the party of one man, fueled by political extremism and obsessed with pushing the big lie and stripping away fundamental freedoms, like a woman's right to reproductive choice. The stakes could not be higher. That's why we need Democrats abroad to ensure our patriots overseas get your ballots in. So I'll close where I started. Please go to votefromabroad.org and make sure you vote in the 2022 election. So much is on the line and we need you to continue to move America forward. Take care and please get out and vote. Wasn't that a great video? Thank you again to the Senator for taking the time to record it for us. Okay, and let's repeat what he said. Make sure to request your ballot, vote it ballot, your ballot and return it so that we can make sure that Senator Van Hollen is reelected in November. Now I'll pass it back to Beth to introduce our next candidate. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, our next speaker, unfortunately, could not attend in person today, uh, but with myself born and raised there, I share her deep commitment to advocating for Maryland's Congressional District 1, geographically Maryland's largest district, which includes 11 counties and all of the Eastern Shore. Heather Mazur has spent her professional life over the last 25 years passionately engaged in public service. She's a policy expert, a former elected official, and a gubernatorial candidate a farmer and the founder and CEO of a nonprofit organization focused on bridging the partisan political divide. The common thread through all of her work is a desire to advance bold policy while building consensus and creating the connections needed to face the challenges ahead. 
We will now share with you our video from U.S. House District 1 candidate, Heather Mazur. I grew up playing basketball in tiny Blue Mound, Illinois. Our school didn't have a team for girls and the coach wouldn't let me try out for the boys team. But my dad wasn't one to take no for an answer. For months, he came home from work at the Caterpillar plant and called school board members, organized parents, and raised a fuss. By the time I started high school, there was a girls team. I was raised to break new ground. I worked my way into a policy job on Capitol Hill while I was still in college. I married my wife, Deborah, 10 years before the Supreme Court said we had the right to do so. I ran for governor on a policy platform that was light years ahead of any other candidates. Now, Deborah and I run a small organic farm on the Eastern Shore, doing our part to be responsible stewards of our land and water. Working together for big, bold change is the only way to build a better future. And Andy Harris is behind the times. He clings to old hatreds and new conspiracies. He does what's best for Donald Trump, not for us. Harris supported the big lie that incited the January 6th attack on our Capitol. He tried to pick a fistfight in Congress and smuggle a gun onto the House floor. He even voted against a bipartisan effort to set up a commission to investigate the January 6th attack. He's given up the right to represent us in Congress. I believe in blazing a trail on the issues I care deeply about. That's why in Annapolis, I passed the law keeping kids on their parents' health insurance until they're 25, years before Obamacare. I pushed to legalize, tax, and regulate marijuana to fund education while others dragged their feet. I made sure every Marylander had the right to marry the person they love. And I helped put a stop to fracking, knowing it wasn't safe for our families or our environment. And now I'm ready to be your Congresswoman. We deserve representation that reflects the best qualities of who we are and where we're from. Help me end the Harris embarrassment and get Washington back on track. What a phenomenal candidate that we have with Heather <clears throat> running in Maryland's first congressional district. We absolutely must get out the vote to flip the first. Moving along for our event, I would like to go ahead and hand it over, back over to Ann Hessa to introduce our next candidate speaker. Okay, thanks Beth. My God, she is a wonderful candidate, isn't she? Ah, oh, that made me so excited to hear that. But I have a fabulous candidate to introduce too, and I'm really excited about this person. I'm going to introduce Glenn Ivy to all of us. Well, Glenn grew up in, in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, and the schools in his hometown were still segregated when he started attending. But he watched his mother, a librarian, desegregate four different white schools. And he watched his father work for Federal War on Poverty Agency that helped unemployed workers in Eastern North Carolina get their training and find jobs. It was then that he saw the power of public service and the impact that advocates can have on social justice. And ever since, Glenn has been a tireless fighter for his community. As Prince George's County State's Attorney, he created the first of its kind domestic violence prosecution unit and pushed for stronger witness intimidation penalties. When the real estate market went south, Glenn stood up for homeowners by establishing an award-winning mortgage fraud unit. Glenn Ivey has served on Capitol Hill as chief counsel to the Senate Majority Leader, as counsel to Senator Paul Sarbanes during the Whitewater investigations, as chief majority counsel to the Senate Banking Committee, and on the staff of Representative John Conyers. He also worked for U.S. Attorney Eric Holder as an assistant U.S. attorney and as chair of Maryland's Public Service Commission. He was twice elected as state's attorney for Prince George's County, where he worked with the Obama administration to cut crime. He served on County Executive Angela Isobrook's Police Reform Task Force in 2020 as chair of the committee that examined the police department's internal policies. Mr. Ivey established the law firm Ivey and, La and Leave Town in 2020 and recently represented a Lafayette Square protester, arguing that the facial recognition software used to identify him compounds discrimination against dark-skinned people. Well, the Justice Department 
throughout the case. But there's more work to be done. The county is facing challenges that this has not seen in generations. And that's why Glenn is running for Congress to create good paying jobs, to ensure access to affordable health care and housing, make our criminal justice system more just, and give hardworking Americans the chance to succeed, no matter which zip code they're from. You see why I'm so excited about this <laughs> candidate? Mr. Ivy, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, I, I appreciate that introduction. I, that's that's um, very enthusiastic and very well researched. Uh, I, I appreciate it very much. And thank you for the chance to uh, have a speak to you, uh, a chance to speak to you all, and and hear from you as well. I'm I'm Glenn Ivy. I'm running for Congress, as you heard. Um, and this is just one note for a uh, point of clarification or, or uh, conversation here. My daughter is overseas. She's currently in. Um, in Poland, working to help with uh, the, the refugee uh, crisis out of Ukraine. And she's been overseas now for about 12 years. Um, she went over after, after her college uh, time was over. She got her master's at uh, Sciences Po in France. And then she stayed over in Africa and Europe, uh, mainly in Africa, doing a lot of uh, food security work and other types of relief work. So I think some of the challenges, oh, and her husband's from Germany. So, uh, and, and, they now have a child, my, my, my grandson, who's uh, two and a half, and um, I get to do a lot of Zoom calls with him, but uh, look forward to seeing more of them, you know, if and when they come back more. But, but I guess that's a long way of saying I, I hear your perspective frequently. Um, she's always, she's frequently asking what's going on in the United States. I, I know that the, uh, you know, overseas media covers things very differently than we do here. And, uh, and, you know, so it's great to have her perspective on these things and on some of the challenges that she faces from, you know, living overseas, you know, with respect to tax issues, retirement security issues and the like. So um, I, I'm, I'm definitely anxious to hear about those from you all. I, I don't know, are you all doing a, a Q&A format or should I, how do you want to proceed? Um, um, we have a few questions for you if you're ready. Okay, sure, all fire right. away. The first oh, question, is your daughter a member of the Democrats Abroad Global Women's Caucus? Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, she's based in D.C., but um, <laughs> yeah, she's, you know, it's, it's interesting because I have some of my kids are extremely politically active, like my son uh -huh. Julian in the House of Delegates, uh, but three of them are, you know, kind of ran from it. But um, she, she's definitely interested in politics and votes and, and um, I think she's voting I think for you. Yeah, and it, and especially got interested in the um, yeah after the Dobbs decision, the Supreme Court decision. I think caught her uh, off guard, and it was very unexpected and frankly shocking to her, as it was to so many of us. So I, I think that there's um, you know a, a, a renewed interest and focus, um, and I don't think that's just limited to people who've been overseas. I think there've been a lot of Democrats who uh, kind of were were sleeping at the wheel, especially on uh, women's rights issues and those in particular. Um, and surprisingly, Justice Thomas went out of his, his way to implicate a variety of other uh, right to privacy issues too, like, um, uh, you know, marriage, uh, marriage choice, uh, interracial marriage. I think he, he didn't touch on for obvious reasons, but it was implicated by his analysis. Uh, so I, I think, um, you know, this is a big election coming up because those rights are now on uh, on the table, um, they're on the, the the election slate, and I think we have to focus on them and make sure we turn people out so we can get things done. Okay, well, we have a few questions for you. First off, you mentioned the taxation problem, so I'd, I'd like to hand off to um, someone from our taxation task force, Mary Moritz. Ready to ask your question? I am. Thank you, and and thank you. Um, it's wonderful here that you have your your daughter overseas, and she is probably very familiar as uh, with um, the tax burden that we carry as uh, overseas Americans. Um, I have a very specific question, though. Um, it's about the um, Congressional American Abroad Caucus. Um, it exists to provide a forum for discussion of the issues that are important to uh, overseas Americans, including citizenship, uh, census, voting, banking access, which is also difficult for us, and taxation. 
Given you'll represent uh, constituents inside the district as well as abroad, will you join the Congressional American Abroad Caucus once elected to stay in the loop on the issues that are important to us? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, you know, Prince George's County and the 4th Congressional District in particular are uh, uh, very diverse. We have a lot of immigrants here, uh, people mm -hmm. from overseas, Africa and Latin America in particular. And as I mentioned, you know, I, I've got my daughter overseas, but there are a lot of us here in, in Prince George's County in the 4th District who have relatives overseas. In some instances, they're U.S. citizens working abroad like my daughter. Um, but I think those are key issues. I don't think they get as much attention as they really should. And I think it's important for us to do more. Uh, my hope is that more Americans will um, become more focused on uh, the broader world, uh, you know, the global, the global context, uh, certainly from the standpoint of the impact that we have, but, but, you know, set aside the America first agenda that's been pushed by some quarters and you know, sort of try and return to our position as citizens of the world and, and leaders of the free world. Um, but yes, I think I, I would definitely want to join that caucus and be involved in what's going on there. Uh, as far as committee assignments, you know, I, I don't know yet. Foreign affairs is something that that some people have discussed with me, and I, I had a chance to talk to uh, the chairman uh, last week, um, so that's certainly a possibility. But apparently. These things don't get sorted out until the after the election as for an incoming freshman like me you, you know you're the the last person on the totem pole but but that's certainly one i want to look at thank okay, you thanks. thanks glenn um will you take a question from carlos palau from the global hispanic caucus now absolutely carlos yes great Thank you very much uh, for taking a, a, a question. Uh, my question is the following one. Uh, according to the census, Latin uh, persons represent 11.1% uh, of the Maryland's population, uh, nearly uh, uh, doubling from 6% in 2008. Uh, notably, this population grew 48% uh, over the 2000-2006 period. Uh, this is significant uh, and shows a clear growing trend in years to come. Not only so the numbers uh, of Latins persons in governance be representative of their communities, but we should also advocate for them to run for office. So my question is, uh, what, what measures would you put in place to ensure that the number of Latins persons in governance reflects their districts? And how will you advocate for them to run for those positions? Thank you very much. Sure. I mean, I think there's sort of two categories there. One is people who are employed in the government, and the other is people who are running for office in the government. Um, I think with respect to running for office, that's relatively easy for me. We've got um, uh, a few people here in Prince George's County who uh, have come out of the, the Latin American community and uh, have run for office. For example, Victor Ramirez is uh, a, a very close personal friend of our family. Uh, we supported him when he ran for state Senate. Uh, I supported him when he ran for uh, state's attorney, which is like the district attorney for Prince George's County, which is a position I'd held previously. And uh, we just supported him again when he was running for the county council. So I've certainly been there in support of him and others um, over the years. We haven't had a lot of people of, of you know, Latino descent uh, running for office here in Prince George's County. I'm hoping that will grow as sort of first generation immigrants become, uh, you know, second generation. And, uh, uh, but, you know, that's a transition that we've had to work uh, to accelerate and help. So for example, um, when I was state's attorney, I was elected in 02. One of the things I did was hire a liaison uh, to the community uh, who was bilingual and could, could communicate and could actually also help to build, I'll call it a political infrastructure within the community. So. He has sort of lat natural leadership positions. Um, but I'll tell you what got me started on it. I went to speak to a PTA uh, in my town. I lived in, I live in Chevrolet. Um, and when I got there to speak to the group, the, the room it sort of split into two groups. There were people who spoke English and then people who spoke <laughs> Spanish. Um, and as I was speaking, um, one of the people on, on the Spanish speaking side was translating. And someone on the English speaking side shushed the translator. Um, and so I was like, well, you know, wait a second, what's going on here? 
they need to hear their kids are in school here just like everybody else's so they need to hear what's going on but to me that was a big indication of a challenge of sort of a, a lack of of understanding about the need to reach out to the community and make sure they were included so in my view and we started pushing this geez i guess it's 20 years ago now involvement in leadership positions starting with like ptas uh coaches uh community associations homeowners associations those positions we wanted to try and help fill out and we did and now those people are starting to to run for lower level positions like school school board state delegate and the like um, and I think we have to keep pushing that it hasn't happened as quickly as I had hoped frankly um, but in order to get people to run for elective office uh, for a lot of times they have to build their own constituency in that way and then do the crossover piece so I, I think we're working on that from an employment standpoint as I mentioned I hired a, a translator or, or a, 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 a communicate and a uh, a liaison to the community who was bilingual, but we didn't stop there. So I had two deputies in my office. One of my deputies was uh, of, of Latin American origin and uh, you know second generation, uh, fluent in Spanish. In fact, when he left my office, he went to the Department of Justice um, to go train prosecutors in, in Latin American countries. Uh, using American rule of law principles. So I think we have to have the aggressive hiring approach uh, within offices. And I think we should hold elected uh, leaders like me to those kinds of standards. And I also think we've got to help people run for office. And that includes recruitment and, and fundraising to help them get there. Well, th thank you very much for your great work. Let, let's keep pushing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And back to Beth now. Hi, Mr. Ivy. Um, my name is Beth Landry. I'm the Maryland State Team Lead. Um, and so I have uh, a question for you in terms of the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, Democrats abroad celebrated the passage of last month. All Americans, including residents of co uh, Congressional District 4, will live to see the enormous impact of climate change in their lifetimes. Given that the act includes measures to promote renew renewable energy and mitigate climate change, in what ways will this bill positively impact CD4 residents? And what are real changes that they'll see from this legislation? Well, with respect to climate change, I, I know it's the biggest commitment. I, I guess it's not just in the United States history, but in world history, as far as committing resources to help address uh, climate change and slow it down. Uh, and I, I applaud the president for, for that. I was uh, pleasantly surprised that we were able to get something passed uh, in the Congress, especially in the Senate, because uh, we, we had some real um, barriers there. I, I won't go into details, but uh, you know, found a way to overcome those and move forward. Having said that, um, it's, it's a good step. It's a big step, uh, but it's only the first step. And we've got to make sure that we continue to do more. Um, I don't know if you all are able to track sort of the weather disasters we're having over here. I think, I think the week before last, we had uh, 5,000 year floods uh, in one week. And that's not just domestically here in the United States. I think people have seen what happened in Pakistan and, and in other places. I think it's clear that we've got to accelerate what we're doing um, and be more aggressive with it. I, you know, the United States, I think, um, one quick gripe that I had, you know, when uh, the tail end of the Trump administration, um, the Postal Service was looking at replacing its vehicles and they were looking to replace them with electric vehicles as opposed to gas power vehicles. That was over overturned or overruled by the, uh, the Trump appointee. And so I thought that was a big miss and an opportunity there. But I think that the federal government needs to find ways to um, with the electricity and, and energy that it procures, find ways to get more clean energy. I think we have to continue to subsidize clean energy. We've got to expand the ability to, um, uh, you know, for, for electric vehicles to find stations where they can, uh, you know, get juice back up and get back on the road, because that'll make it easier for people to buy them and expand them. Uh, and I also think the, uh, the, the grid, you know, um, and it's, it's not a single grid, there are multiple grids for the, that transport electron, uh, electricity around the country. We're gonna have to upgrade that and make it more efficient. And also it's gonna need to reflect the increased amount of power that it's gonna have to carry. Cause right now we've got 
places like I believe it was Oregon, where they're having to uh, they're looking at rolling blackouts just because they can't accommodate the amount of power and because they're worried about creating wildfire scenarios out there. So I think we've got a good step that, that, that we took, but we've got a long ways to go. Uh, and if we maintain control of the Senate and the House, in fact, I think we need to expand control of the Senate, uh, the Biden administration can do more and do more faster. But the only way it's going to happen is if, if, we can, if we retain control over the House and the Senate as well. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, Beth. Beth, um, now are there more questions or should we move on to the next? I, well, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank you, um, Mr. Ivy, for joining us today um, and taking the time to speak to Maryland, uh, Maryland voters. And some of us are voters in other states uh, about these issues. Um, it really does matter to hear from uh, from uh, representatives, especially in the far flung places around the world that we are. So again, thank you. Um, I did want to uh, give firm examples like I just asked of you to the people who are on the call today. What are firm actions that you can take attendees on the call for taking action? In addition, we've been hammering about, let's make sure that we vote. But there's a lot of other things that we can do as people who are living abroad, even if we're not stateside. Um, so I wanted to go over those. And um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and transition. Thank you so much. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you once you're in office. I look forward to working with you in the future and keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. And so uh, I'm going to take a second just to, uh, we're waiting for our next candidate to uh, sign on, which we don't see him here as of yet. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen really quickly about the things that we can do to take action. And so, uh, you should be seeing on the screen now if someone can give me a thumbs up 10 actions to take now. Thank you. Um, so, of course, requesting your ballot. We said that before. Go to votefromabroad.org. Um, you also can add VFA to your email signature. It can be something that uh, can advo advocate for the vote when you're doing other things in, in your regular activities with email. And also sharing VFA and voting information on social media. Also, one of the things that you can do is send something called an alma mater letter. We have a campaign right now that is uh, people reaching out as alumni living around the world to uh, the programs where they went to universities uh, to uh, find out what information voters are who are studying abroad are getting when they're going overseas and to make sure that they are able to also vote. You can phone bank with Democrats abroad. It is highly effective. We are doing it now. Uh, you can sign up to make calls to Democrats abroad voters. And um, as someone who led a uh, phone, phone banking campaign myself in 2020, six out of 10 times the person almost shouts with delight when they hear from you because they love making sure that they can vote. You can also get trained with voting assistance to help voters um, and you can see that there for number six. You can do like we are doing. We have several state teams, but we don't have one for all of our states. So you can join the Maryland state team or you can join one of the other state teams. I believe we have 13 now uh, as a voter or an ally. You can also adopt a campaign and push on social media. Uh, you can do next. Uh, number nine is very important. Uh, one of the top reasons that people vote is because someone that they know talked to them about how, the importance of voting. So you can help three people get their ballots and help them to help three more. So we can cascade this out and make sure that all of those 9 million voters that Senator Van Hollen referenced can cast their votes. And then finally, donating. Um, if it's not your time or your talent, perhaps your treasure. If you can donate to help get out the vote, uh, and we have a page that should be popped into the chat 
that has all of these links here for at your convenience that you can take a look and um, participate in any way that works for you. The page is in the chat. Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and stop screen sharing. But I wanted to make sure that people knew that there is there are many other things that people can do in addition to voting. And with that, I would ask, is our next candidate here? If you're looking for John Sarbanes, I'm here. Ah, excellent. Hi. <laughs> can you see me? We, um, we might need to spotlight you. Ah, there you are. You're under a different name. We've got you now. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Glad, name, glad to might... see you, sir. I'm, I'm, my name is Beth. I'm going to transition over to Melanie now, who's going to uh, to introduce you and thank you for hopping on today. Sure. My pleasure. Um, hi, uh, my name is Melanie Gardner. I live in Canada, uh, Ottawa, Canada, um, and vote in Congressman Sarbanes' 3rd District. I'm a Excellent. member of the board of the Capital City uh, Regions chapter of Democrats Abroad and am a, a member at large of the Democrats Abroad Seniors Caucus. And I am honored to introduce Congressman John Sarbanes. Uh, Congressman Sarbanes represents the third congressional district and is a lifelong Marylander. In Congress, he serves on the House <clears throat> Committee on Energy and Commerce um, as the vice chair of the House Subcommittee on Health and um, is a <clears throat> member of the House Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change. He also uh, sits on the uh, House Committee on Oversight and Government Operations Subcommittee. Congressman Sarbanes is running to serve the diverse needs of his constituents, especially as we recover and rebuild our economy following the unprecedented <clears throat> challenges of the COVID pandemic. Uh, before he was elected to Congress, uh, Congressman Sarbanes worked at the Maryland State Department of Education to make our school system the best in the country. As an attorney in private practice, he represented doctors and hospitals and other healthcare providers to build a high quality healthcare system. And he worked with organizations like the Public Justice Center to protect the environment and ensure equality and opportunity for all Marylanders. Congressman Sarbanes is working hard to help families with rising costs, create good paying jobs and strengthen our education systems. <clears throat> He's also fighting to keep our government transparent and accountable, ensure access to affordable health care, preserve the Chesapeake Bay, and protect our planet from the dangerous threat of climate change. He led the charge in, in Congress to limit the influence of big money in politics and strengthen the vote and the voice of every American. Whether it's the economy, energy, and the environment, health care, or any other critical issue, special interests and well-connected insiders are calling the shots in Washington. We need to return the government of by and for the people. Uh, and I must say that Con Congressman Sarbanes is a very good uh, person. He keeps in touch with his constituents. Um, that's from personal experience. <laughs> so over to you, Congressman Sarbanes. Uh, well, thank you very, very much. I, I appreciate it. I was trying to adjust so I didn't have this bright light shining in on me. So I'll I'll apologize that there's some glare here. Um, I did just uh, come from, and, for, and it's great to be introduced by a constituent, let me say that. Um, I did just come from an event celebrating the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Clean Water Act. And we were at Sandy Point State Park, which is a beautiful park right on the bay near the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, uh, celebrating that landmark legislation that we have used, uh, the authority of which we have used over the last 50 years to try to clean up our, our rivers, our streams, our tributaries, national treasures like the Chesapeake Bay. 
and recommitting ourselves to doing that for the next uh, 50 years. And we've been able to secure our delegation some very significant funding, both through the annual appropriations process, as well as more recently through the bipartisan infrastructure and investment bill, uh, additional dollars that can help support the revitalization of the Chesapeake Bay. So uh, that's my environmental pitch for, for, for today, but would be happy to talk about any other issues relating to that topic as we move forward. Let me just step back for a moment. Uh, thank you for your uh, interest and engagement. There's no more important moment than this one for uh, Americans, wherever they may be, to stand up and uh, fight and for and fortify their democracy. I had the privilege, really, for the last 15 years, intensely over the last four or five years, of leading the charge in Washington on broad democracy reform efforts, uh, not just fighting the insidious influence that big money has on how public policy gets made, but trying to uh, create a new framework of uniform standards across the country for how we register and access the ballot box, um, as well as fixing partisan gerrymandering, making ethics reforms, we had a large comprehensive piece of legislation called the For the People Act, which I helped uh, lead, and we passed it twice in the House of Representatives in the last two Congresses. We got very close in the Senate. If you all were uh, tracking this effort, you will know that we got 48 Democratic senators to agree to change the rules of the filibuster to allow a vote on what was then called the Freedom to Vote Act, which was the Senate version of what we introduced in the House. We couldn't get those last two. Um, and without those last two, we were unable to change the rules to get the bill onto the floor where it would have passed because those last two also supported the bill, even though they didn't support changing the rules to get the bill across the finish line. We're not giving up, but I think um, there's an appreciation that this fight is largely now been shifted into the individual states. By the fight, I mean the fight to make sure we protect uh, our democracy, the fundamental tenets and infrastructure of our democracy. In particular, to make sure that last sacred space, which is the polling place, uh, the place where the voter uh, interacts uh, in terms of making a decision about a candidate or the remote equivalent of that, which is voting by absentee uh, ballot, that that is protected and preserved. Uh, and also that we somehow overcome the disinformation that is spreading, unfortunately, very quickly in the country and undermines people's confidence in the outcome of elections. Because whether you're Democrat or Republican or independent, if you can't agree uh, on the integrity of the results from an election, uh, then you're completely unmoored when it comes to your democracy. So that's been an area of focus of mine. The environment, as I mentioned, has certainly been um, a principal concern. Uh, healthcare is another area based on my, um, my prior career, which was as a healthcare attorney representing hospitals and healthcare providers in Maryland and throughout this region. I came to Congress with a very strong interest in that topic and was privileged to be part of shaping the Affordable Care Act uh, from my position on the Energy and Commerce Committee back in 2008. Um, and obviously, we, we got that across the finish line. We've been trying to build on it and strengthen it ever since. AmeriCorps and volunteer and citizen engagement opportunities is another area that I brought uh, real attention to. Um, but let me, let me, before I turn it back to you, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have, uh, let me just sort of summarize what's been achieved in the last 18 months, which is remarkable. Um, in fact, I think you may have to go back to the New Deal, um, maybe to some period in the 1960s and early 70s, uh, to find a time when in that in, in such a limited period, we were able to get as many things passed in Washington and signed into law. 
And there's basically four major pieces of legislation. You're familiar with them, but just to quickly uh, summarize. One, the first one was the American Rescue Plan, uh, which was a monumental effort to help people get through the pandemic, strengthen our economy, and helped create um, millions of jobs over the last 18 months, more jobs being created um, in that period of time than ever in an equivalent period of time in American history. Uh, so that was very, very important for small businesses, for families, for individuals across the country to help them navigate this very difficult time in our country. Uh, we then passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment Act, uh, which will mean that we are celebrating and investing in um, upgrading our physical infrastructure in this country for decades to come. Billions of dollars flowing to Maryland and other states across the country to make sure that we're not taking our infrastructure for granted. In Maryland alone, we're going to see um, repairs to our ports, to the airport, uh, to bridges, to tunnels uh, that are sorely in need of repair. Um, and it's going to make a huge difference just to how we move around as a country, um, how we get up with confidence every day. Um, and move through our day, but also it's going to create hundreds of thousands, if not millions over time of good paying jobs. So very proud that we achieved that. The third thing we were able to do was the Chips and Science Act. We know, given all the supply chain problems but even recently, but even preceding that, we know that uh, we got to make more of the things that matter and that go into all of the various appliances and conveniences we have. We got to make more of those uh, component parts in our own country. And we haven't been doing that. About 90% of the semiconductor chips that are required for the products that we all depend on are made in East Asia. So with the passage of the Chips and Science Act, not only are we investing in STEM education to make sure the next generation is stepping up with innovation and entrepreneurship to lead our country, uh, but we're making sure that uh, we're going to make those chips and other things here in the United States and incentivize American manufacturers. So that was a huge uh, win for the country. And finally, the most recent victory was the Inflation Reduction Act, which, as you know, have been um, consigned to sort of the, the uh, cemetery of legislation, but was suddenly revived. And we were able to get it passed recently and the president signed it. Um, it is the largest investment in um, climate action by the federal government uh, ever. And it's a combination of providing incentives for consumers to move more quickly towards more efficient and climate friendly and energy and clean energy efficient products, appliances and so forth but at the same time providing incentives so that American manufacturers and companies and businesses can step into this space in a meaningful way. The passage of the climate provisions in this bill um, were a proclamation to the rest of the world that the United States is coming up to the table to play a leadership role in this existential crisis that we all face. The other piece of it that I'm proud of in addition to, frankly, that we, we got some savings in this bill to reduce the deficit. But for the first time, pretty much ever, we now have the ability, it's not comprehensive, but it's a start to begin negotiating with pharmaceutical companies on the cost of prescription drugs on behalf of Medicare beneficiaries. This has been something that people have been talking about for decades. I know we were trying to do it when I first got to Congress back in 2007. We finally broke in the stranglehold that those industries have had and um, are going to be able to achieve some savings. Uh, limiting out-of-pocket expenses for Medicare beneficiaries on prescription drugs to no more than $2,000 a, a month. And also making sure that, again, Medicare beneficiaries do not have to pay more than $35 a month for insulin, uh, which we know many depend upon. Um, we strengthen the Affordable Care Act by continuing some important subsidies to help people purchase insurance in the various health exchanges and took some other really meaningful steps on the health care front. 
So four big bills, the American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment Act, the Bipartisan Ships and Science Act, and then the Inflation Reduction Act. One other thing I'll just note is that we passed something called the PACT Act, which will help uh, veterans with benefits, um, those who've suffered from the effects of these uh, toxic waste dumps and the burning of these in these burn pits. Um, that will also bring investment in VA clinics across the country. So some really good things that we should be celebrating. I'm in campaign mode right now, as you can imagine, as we head into the home stretch. And I find that the most important thing is just to let people know what we've done, because sometimes um, with the confusion and being bombarded with all these other things, um, it's hard for people to appreciate the accomplishments that we've delivered for them. I think when they know that, when they see what's in these bills, when they appreciate that it's always been about responding to their priorities, um, that they'll make a choice in November to continue with that kind of leadership in the next Congress. I very much hope that that's the case. With that, let me turn it back to you and look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you so much for joining us today, Congressman Sarbanes. And just, we wanna really express our gratitude from all of us living overseas for the work that you're doing that um, helps our friends and families living back home and is really near and dear to our hearts. And we truly appreciate it. And we thank you for coming to speak to us today and to spend this time with, uh, with Americans living abroad and Marylanders living abroad. We probably just have time for one quick question, but this is also one that's near and dear to our heart. And we've also had a panelist question, or an audience question about overseas taxation. Perhaps you could um, have a look at that and maybe you would uh, send us an answer to that later. But sure. In, maybe you can also address this just a little bit about, you know, the burden that overseas taxation or that taxation is for us as living overseas. And I think Mary is going to address that in her question. I'll hand over to Mary. from okay. the Hi, yes, thank you. And I, I was thinking exactly the same thing that Jennifer just said when I was listening to you uh, talk about all the wonderful things that have been happening back home is that we often vote as overseas voters. We often vote for our family. Um, because there are specific issues, uh, in-country issues that we are not going to, that we aren't at this point in our lives being touched by. But as overseas voters, we are being, and overseas Americans, we are definitely touched by issues that the that the the, the citizens in the country aren't. And so, my question is very specific. Um, the uh, Congressional Americans Abroad Caucus exists uh, to provide a forum for discussions of the issues that are important to overseas Americans, including citizenship, census, voting, banking access, and taxation. And I am a volunteer with the Taxation Task Force to help get that information out specifically to our Congress people and our senators. So given that you will represent constituents inside the district as well as abroad, will you join the Congressional Americans Abroad Caucus once, you, uh, well, once elected, meaning hopefully re-elected, uh, to stay in the loop on our status? Well, I'm absolutely interested in understanding more about the issues you mentioned, and I think being part of that caucus would be very helpful to me. So we'll take, we'll take a look at that. In the meantime, if you could send I'm sure you have a white paper um, on the various topics you just mentioned in terms of the impact on overseas Americans. Um, Absolutely. So I'd like, to, uh, yeah, I'd like to take a look at that and, and make sure that I'm more well versed on the issues generally. But obviously, from this group, it's an extremely fair question and a fair point to make. So uh, I stand ready to get more educated on that front. If the caucus is an opportunity to do that, then it's something I'll take a very close look at. Wonderful. Thank you. And we will be yeah. in touch. Okay. Excellent. Well, Congressman Sarbanes, we deeply appreciate your time uh, and the work you do on all your subcommittees and committees and outreach. Um, and thank you for joining us today. It's very well, important. I, I appreciate it. Let me just end with a plea. Um, I don't know how easy or hard it is for you to um, gain perspective on some of the threats being posed right now to kind of the basic small d democratic uh, tenets of our American society. But 
Um, I'd urge you not to take anything for granted in this moment. And to the extent you yourselves or your families or your extended peer groups can find a way, modest perhaps, but any way of leaning in and taking some responsibility for just education, good information, and participation in our democracy at the community level, I would urge you to do so because there are some strong anti-democratic forces on the move right now. I see it every single day and it's posing a real threat to things. So I thank you for your interest. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to join with you today and look forward to continuing to stay in touch as we move forward. Excellent, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Thank you, Congressman Sarbanes. I'm going to hand this off to uh, Beth. Thank you, Melanie. I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Aruna Miller, for Maryland's next lieutenant governor. Aruna Miller has devoted her life to public service and removing systemic barriers to opportunity. Her family immigrated to the United States from India when she was seven. She graduated from the University of Science and Technology with a degree in civil engineering and chose a life of public service in Maryland, spending 25 years working at the local Department of Transportation in Montgomery County to improve the safety of the public and alleviate traffic and creating equitable transportation access to connect people to opportunities. From 2010 to 2018, she represented, represented District 15 in the Maryland House of Delegates where she worked with her constituents to create legislation to invest in STEM education, streamline the regulatory process for small business businesses, and was a champion for working families, survivors of domestic abuse, and the environment. She ran for Congress in 2018 in Maryland's sixth con congressional district, finishing second in a crowded field of eight candidates. She lives in Montgomery County with her husband, Dave, where they raised three daughters. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. And I got to tell you, I am so excited to be here at Democrats Aboard. And Beth, uh, you just took half my speech away, so I'm going to have to make up something here. But anyway, it is such an honor to be here with all of you. And I got to tell you, folks, I was looking at your website. This is so impressive. I'd never been on it. Number one, you have very clear and easy to understand content. The level of detail on current issues, wow, unbelievable. I'm, you know, instead of going to the Washington Post, I think I'm just going to come over to your website to find out what's the latest and greatest happening here in the United States of America. And then I also want to, you know, say thank you for the magnitude of your outreach, um, you know, to not just uh, Democrats all over living in different countries, but you're doing it in different languages as well. And uh, this is how you deliver democracy from aboard. So uh, abroad. So thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, one other thing that I noticed when I was on your website was you have a little area called tiny actions. Because, you know, I got to tell you, I, I mean, that immediately appealed to me because I will tell you when I go talk to Democrats throughout the state of Maryland, they will say that democracy is not easy to navigate. Oftentimes, I think as a party, we tend to want to share all the many ways Democrats can participate in our democracy beyond just voting. And it can be a little overwhelming on the other side when you're just dipping your toes in and want to get active with the party. So I really, really appreciate that area that you have called tiny actions, you know, just doing a thing here, a thing there that can make all the difference. So kudos to all of you. And I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for never, ever taking our democracy for granted, even when it seems thousands of miles away. So thank you for your unwavering activism abroad, because it matters at home. And thank you to the organizers, volunteers that make up the Maryland State team of Democrats abroad right? Yeah. The global Black, Hispanic, women's, veterans, and, uh, and military families caucuses as well. So, so much appreciate everything you're doing. 
And I just want to give a great big shout out to my friends uh, who are also or will be joining you later and you'll get to hear from them. Delegate Bengal and Democratic nominee Millicent Hall. She's awesome. Wait till you hear from her. There she is. <laughs> so I just want to tell you a little bit about the gubernatorial race. So in 2021, there were only two gubernatorial races in uh, our country. It was New Jersey and Virginia. The Republican Party picked up one seat in 2021 elections, and that was in Virginia. With that lone pickup, Republicans now hold 28 of the nation's uh, 50 governorships with Democrats holding 22. This year, 36 states will hold gubernatorial elections. 16 of those races will take place in states with Democratic governors, while 20 will take place in states where Republicans currently hold a seat. So I got some good news and I got some really good news. The good news is that with your help, we can flip some of these red states to blue, the really good news is Maryland just happens to be one of those states that's about to be flipped from red to blue. And you know how I know that? Because I am Aruna Miller, and I am honored to be your Democratic nominee for Lieutenant Governor of Maryland with my friend Wes Moore. You know, everyone has a story to tell when it comes to public service. And mine starts, and Beth, I think you talked about it. I came to this country when I was seven years old. But here's a little detail of that. I will never forget stepping off the airplane in my dad's arms. It was in New York. It was February 1972. And I looked into the airport and I saw these hundreds of people waiting in the airport. And I'm thinking to myself, holy moly, I love this country. Every one of those people are waiting for my dad and I to arrive to this country. And then I got really excited when I thought they were throwing confetti at us because they were so elated to have my dad and I. Turned out it wasn't confetti, it was snow. And I'd never seen snow before in my life. But you know what? I've never stopped being excited about this great country and the great opportunities and promises that it has for every immigrant and for all Americans. And that's why I dedicated my life to public service from early on. And as Beth said, I've been living in Maryland for over 32 years. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about my running mate, who's also uh, Maryland is his home. Wes Moore is a third generation Marylander. He's a Rhodes Scholar, a White House Fellow, a US Army combat veteran who served in Afghanistan in the 82nd Airborne, and a former CEO of one of the nation's largest poverty fighting organizations. So that's who Wes Moore is, and I cannot tell you how excited I am to be on a ticket with Wes Moore. Look, folks, we're less than 60 days away from the election in November, and it's important to unify our party and voters across the state and across the globe, because we know that the 2022 elections, midterm elections, are not about fighting against something. They're about fighting for everything, because the battle for our democracy is on the ballot. Women's reproductive rights are on the ballot. Closing the racial wealth gap is on the ballot. Investing in education is on the ballot. Combating climate change is on the ballot. Healthcare, protecting our veterans and all military families, public safety, and so much more is on the ballot. And with your help, and through hope, unity, and optimism, we can build the Maryland where we leave no one behind. Because history will show that it is hope, unity, and optimism that gave us civil rights, voting rights, women's rights, workers' rights, LGBTQ rights, and immigrant rights. Because democracy is not the law of the majority, but the protection of the minority. So Democrats abroad, democracy needs you, Maryland needs you, and those who have been left behind need you. So let's get Democrats elected up and down the ballot. I'm Aruna Miller, and I am thrilled to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Aruna. We're really, really glad that you could um, attend today. Um, I know that you both of you, all of you, everyone who's helping with you back home is uh, you know, running 
around crazy trying to make sure that you're talking to everybody and um, getting the message out. I do want to pass it over to Michelle, who's also on our Maryland State team for uh, the first question. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I am Michelle Tauby. I vote in, um, well, in Montgomery County in the 8th Congressional District. Um, and I work really hard with helping overseas voters to register and just with all their questions. And so what we want to talk to you to, about today is that there are three challenges for Maryland voters who vote from abroad. Um, so under current Maryland law, uh, Maryland US citizens overseas who have never resided in Maryland, such as children who are born abroad to uniformed services members are unable to register in to vote in Maryland. Hmm. So that means if they can't register, they can't actually vote. Uh, in over half the states, these voters would be able to register to vote with a U.S. citizen parent's voting address, but as they say, that won't work in Maryland um, currently. Uh, the second issue is that Maryland voters abroad who declare that their return to the U.S. is uncertain when they request their absentee ballot are only given a federal ballot and are unable to vote for state and local elections, including the Office of Governor. So two thirds of the states currently allow their citizens abroad to vote the full ballot while Maryland does not. That's if you say you're not, you don't know if you're going to return. Um, and then the third issue is that Maryland voters are required to return their voted ballots exclusively by postal mail, often either at significant financial burden or fraught with uncertainty due to unreliable mail service. So our question to you is, will you support legislation in the state legislature that remedies challenges such as these that Maryland overseas military and civilian voters face? Michelle, thank you for that. And uh, such an important issue. And I also wanna tell you, I live in the eighth district now after redistricting, I was in the sixth, but now I'm in the eighth and thrilled to have Congressman Jamie Raskin as my representative, right? What a rock star he is. So to answer your question, absolutely. We need to ensure that voting in Maryland is as easy and accessible and safe as possible to every individual. And I know the legislature having worked with them and as they continue to work are trying to make it easier and more accessible for our, all Marylanders. Look, we now have early voting, we have Sunday voting, we now have mail-in ballot voting, right? Used to be that you had to have a reason in which you have to request a mail-in ballot, but that's no longer the case. So it's getting better and better every day. And and for the issues that you pointed out, Michelle, I uh, spoke to uh, Delegate Eric Ludke of the Ways and Means Committee earlier. I said, because uh, that's who deals with anything to do with our election laws and all. And he confirmed to me that he is going to be introducing legislation on the first two items that you described. So I am thrilled and excited about that. And if Westmore and I are lucky enough to be your next governor and lieutenant governor, I'll tell you what, you're going to have a partner in Annapolis that is not going to veto bills, but that is going to work in partnership with all our legislators in the Maryland General Assembly to make sure things like this will happen so people can vote. And, you know, nobody is disenfranchised, right? That's what our democracy is about. Now, as far as the third item, I think, you know, what we may need to do, and I don't know, but, um, you know, perhaps the, um, Maryland would be willing to pay for that ballot for you all to mail it back if it's overseas. I don't know if there's any possibilities in that. So if you have any ideas or thoughts that other states are doing on that matter, please let Eric or myself or, you know, anyone know, and we'll be happy to work with you on that, like the best management practices that you have observed in other states. Does that work? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah, uh, we can answer that, but maybe we'll do that <laughs> offline. Sure, would be happy to take it offline with you, Michelle. And uh, thank, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, uh, Aruna, for, for talking uh, about that very important question. It's near and dear to 
um, many people's hearts on this call and those who may be listening after we're done. Um, I wanted to pass it over to Anne Hessa for uh, one more question, who's our Global Women's Caucus Chair. Sure. Okay, thanks so much for taking my question. Also a really important one for women around the world. We know that Maryland recently modernized its approach to abortion access, which required the Democratic legislature to override the veto of the Republican governor, but there's still more to do. So how will you leverage this victory to expand and protect access to abortion for people in Maryland? And since the Kansas victory and nationwide polls have shown us that Democrats can fight for abortion rights and win, even among those independents and Republicans, I'm wondering what your strategy is for reaching out to these crucial swing voters across the political spectrum. Oh, I love that question, Anne. Thank you so much. And I actually read some of your uh, articles on the website, at least, you know, that had your name at the bottom. So thank you for all that as well. And you better believe, Westmore, and I are 1000% behind a woman's right to choose for no matter what. Okay, I can tell you that. And you're right. There is so much work still to be done. So first thing, Westmore, myself, and so many Marylanders are proud of the work done by the Maryland General Assembly, including Delegate Bengal, for authorizing the three and a half million dollars in training for health care providers to expand access to abortion. But as you said, we have a governor who is refusing to release this funding. So what I'd like to say is, on day one, if we are lucky enough to be elected, we're going to release those funds on day one, no doubt about it. And I want to give a great big shout out to Delegate Ariana Kelly, uh, who's also provided tremendous you know, leadership on this matter. Look, not only are we going to do that, but we're going to work with the General Assembly to enshrine the a woman's right to choose in Maryland's constitution. Because look, folks, 90% of Marylanders believe abortion should be legal, and we will ensure our state will be a safe haven for any person needing an abortion, regardless of where they come from. And so when you say, well, how, you know, how do we reach out to independents? And believe me, there are Republicans who support a woman's right to choose as well. They may not be as vocal uh, you know, as we are, but they're there. And I think it's about, you know, going over to them and listening to them and hearing what they have to say, even, you know, those that disagree with you, rather than making a very hostile environment, the dialogue, I think we got to be quick to listen and slow to respond right? Take in, because people come from different walks of life. We're not going to be able to convince everyone over, but particularly those that are independents and moderate uh, Republicans, I think we can persuade them over on the importance of this. Poll after poll, as you said, take a look at the state of Kansas and what they did. Who would have thought in ruby red Kansas that they would have supported this? So there you go. You know, a lot of it is the media puts misinformation out there, I think. And so you give up hope. You think, oh, you know, we really won't be able to address the challenge. Oh, yes, we can. We can do it together. We can do it with the, you know, with the fact that you're talking about women's rights or human rights or civil rights. You know, that's where it all starts. So thank you. Thank you for everything that you do. And I assure you, Westmore and I, along with the Democrats in the General Assembly, are going to fight for this every single day. Thank you, Anne, for that question. And thank you, Aruna, for joining us and and be showing um, people who live abroad, there are people who can't even be here with us because we're in every time zone, right? And so there, there are people who are really eager to hear from you. And um, I encourage them to look more, up more about Wes so they can uh, get introduced uh, to our next Lieutenant Governor and Governor. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. And we'll look forward to talking more about uh, important issues, those discussed on this call, uh, and you know, many more that haven't been discussed on this call. But I know that you all are very busy, and I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, 
thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And we're looking forward. I'm looking forward to seeing you when I'm back in the States and not in Sweden. <laughs> Oh my gosh, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all too. And thank you again for giving me this opportunity to share a little bit about who Westmore and I are with all of you. And thank you for being the great American citizen and never giving up on our democracy and fighting for it each and every day. Look, I'm a transportation engineer. So my favorite thing I like to say is the road to progress is always under construction right? There is no final destination. <laughs> you work at it every single day. So thank you for being the construction workers of our democracy. We are vigilant and we're on it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to go ahead now and forgive me. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next candidate, actually, who... Um, uh, Ms. Miller uh, spoke of a few times when she was talking. Uh, for Heather Bagnell, who is our next speaker, uh, she is the Maryland State Delegate for District, or a Maryland State Delegate for District 33, and she serves on the Health and Government Operations Committee, as well as the Public Health and Minority Health Disparity, Disparities Subcommittee and the Long-Term Care Subcommittee. In addition, she serves as the vice chair of the Anne Arundel County Delegation and the chair of the Public Health Subcommittee in Delegation. She's also a member of the Latino Caucus, the Veterans Caucus, the Transit Caucus, the Waterman's Caucus, and the Women's Caucus, for which this year she was elected to serve as the second vice president. Her membership on the Self-Direction Work Group has allowed her to contribute to and co-sponsor the Self-Direction Act of 2022, which expands, optimizes, and improve self-direction programs in Maryland to meet the needs of some of our most vulnerable populations. In recent years, she has also served a number or received a number of prominent rewards and recognitions, including the Distinguished Service Award from the Maryland Association of the Deaf, Legislator of the Year in 2021 from the Maryland State Dental Association, Census Champion in 2020 from Census Maryland, Legislator of the Year in 2020 from the American College of Emergency Physicians, the Maryland chapter, an education all-star from Strong Schools, Maryland, the Michelle Obama Executive Citation from the Anne Arundel County Executive Stuart Pittman and Caucus of African-American Leaders, and also finally, last but not least, Citation of Achievement from the U.S. Department of Defense. Heather is also an arts educator and award-winning playwright with five original plays to her name, as well as co-founding artistic director of Tasty Monster Productions, a proud member of the Dem Dramatist Guild and vice president of the District 33 Democratic Club. She is running for re-election to the Maryland House of Delegates in the newly created District 33C, which encompasses the Broadneck Peninsula and Lower Severna Park. Learn more and connect with Delegate Bagnall at www.heatherbagnall.com. It's our pleasure to have you here with us, Heather. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for that, that introduction. And, and I cannot express how honored and proud I am to be here and share a seat with such an esteemed panel. Um, I also didn't know I had so much in common with my Congressman and our next Attorney General, Anthony Brown, um, because, uh, like Congressman Brown, when I ran in 2018, um, I was ahead during the early voting, but I was uh, so far down in the race on election day that the, the, the local news actually called the race for my opponent. Um, he was running for his fifth term and, um, and my race was decided 10 days later by the, um, by the uh, vote by mail and provisional ballots. Uh, and it really came down to the wire. I was um, over 600 votes down on election day, and I won by 184 votes on the very last day of, of, of the ballot count. Um, so I know the importance of vote by mail, um, and I've seen that process firsthand. I, I, you know, I, I was invited to, to be there for the canvassing, and it's, it's such an incredible process to witness, um, and it really does instill um, a feeling of, of pride and security in our democratic um, uh, institutions. Um, in 2018, I did become the first Democrat in 20 years in my district. So uh, that is how important this is. And, and even when I was, um, when we were waiting for, for, for the final outcome, 
the press was calling me for for uh, for a quote, and I told them, in all honesty, I said, "Look, I I would love to have a, a Cinderella story in in my district. I think it would be really healthy for my district. I think it would be really healthy for de for democracy." But given that it's taken us 20 years to even get to this point, I have to make sure that that my district is set up for a soft landing, no matter what happens, because. Uh, I didn't want them to feel like they lost twice in, in a week and a half because we would never have this opportunity again. And as everyone on this call knows, uh, making a change can feel incremental, but when you do make the change, it is, it is so significant that it becomes revolutionary. So I just wanna thank you all so much for this invitation um, and for, for inviting local law local, uh, candidates because local politics is so important. Uh, it's not only important to vote, but it's also important to have access to that information about candidates. And one of the things that, that I saw very clearly in 2018 was how difficult by design it can be to, to learn about candidates and how easy it can become to be disconnected from local politics. Local politics kind of trucks along until you need it. And a lot of folks don't really know what we do at the local level. Um, I was often giving a quick civics lesson on the door. Of course, local politics varies significantly state by state. Uh, for those who aren't from Maryland, in Maryland, we have a bicameral system. We have a governor, a Senate, and a House of Delegates. And, um, and so it is very similar to, to the national. And I often make that comparison and I say, you know, we just like the national where you have representatives from their state and they make laws for the entire country, but they represent their state at the local level. We make laws for the state, but we, re we represent our district. Um, and once I frame it that way, people are much more comfortable with it. But, but I did find that a lot of people were disengaged from local politics because they didn't want to look foolish. They didn't want to feel like they didn't know and they felt like they should know. And maybe they were bad citizens because they didn't know and, and therefore they were kind of afraid to ask. And just opening that door, presenting that opportunity in a way that didn't make people feel foolish, that didn't make them feel embarrassed. And it wasn't condescending, but was really um, a desire to, to share information uh, really resonated with people. So I cannot thank you enough for, for this forum that, that makes this process so accessible. Uh, for people overseas. Um, I ran in 2018 because I believe that my greatest contribution in light of, of the, the, the national uh, landscape was in keeping local people safe. Uh, in 2016, I really did wrestle with what I could do. I spent a year writing and, um, and some folks were calling for me to run for office. And I said, well, I, I can't really run at the federal level. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist, I'm an arts administrator and, you know, an arts educator and, and I have no um, political heritage. And I'm in a, a, what is considered a relatively safe state um, in a, a, a district, a congressional district where I was actually really uh, happy with my own representation. But, um, but looking at the local level, I had representatives that did not represent me, did not represent my family did not represent the people I cared about. And having spent 30 years working in the arts, I also knew that, um, you know, I work with a lot of marginalized communities and they didn't represent um, the safety and well being of those communities either. Um, and as we have seen, state legislatures are the bulwark against uh, really restrictive, regressive policies at, at the national level. I have been proud to be unapologetically. Democratic to to lean into those democratic values in um, in a battleground district where um, I really did receive some pushback on that. And what we have found is that by demonstrating pragmatic, responsive representation and still leaning heavily into those democratic values and, and being comfortable sort of hanging in hanging out in the, in that uncomfortable space and not just stopping the conversation, um, that that actually crosses partisan lines. Um, it is foundational work. 
It raises the expectations of constituents. It makes it harder to trick voters into voting against their own self-interest, but it is difficult work and it has to be done at the, at the local level. That's, that's the only place where it's effective and it, it is so incredibly effective. Um, having representatives like me with, with really diverse backgrounds, you know, obviously as running as an artist and in 2018, I was told three things. I said, don't, don't, don't run as an artist. Um, no one will take you seriously. Don't talk about, um, don't talk about uh, affordable housing or public transportation. So I ran as an artist on affordable housing and public transportation, but I, but I felt like it was important because I said, if, if I run as anyone that I'm not and I win, then I have to be someone that I am not for four years, eight years or, or longer. Um, but if I run on these, on these democratic values, these shared values, and the people that helped me win, the people that really sort of uh, unified and, and knocked doors for me and made phone calls and, and, and wrote postcards, they were, they were folks that shared those same democratic values. And what they found is that there were a lot more in our district than people realized. They just had been convinced that, that they were the only one. Um, so democratic values are the values of working families. Um, and, and, and sometimes it, it's just really important to go out and make the case for that. And you have to do it, you know, day after day, door after door, constituent after constituent. Um, and I will say having somebody like me with, with you know, such a, di a different background from, from many of my colleagues, you know, I'm, I've worked in the arts for 30 years. I've worked in the gig economy. Um, I understand uh, the challenges of being an independent contractor, um, especially when the pandemic hit. Uh, I was able to advocate for, on behalf of the arts community, on the behalf of gig workers, independent contractors, to ensure they were included in our relief efforts. Something that, that I think um, if you don't have that voice at the table, um, it can very easily be lost in translation. And especially when we were in a crisis situation, it becomes so much more important because of course, government moves at a glacial pace by design. You don't want it to be easy to write laws. You don't want it to be easy to unwrite laws. But when you are having to pivot quickly um, in, you know, in uh, response to, to a, a crisis, you have to be able to, uh, to, to be a little bit uh, live and, um, and that's sort of the, 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 the arena in which I operate all the time. Um, uh, as, as Beth mentioned, I am on health and government operations. So I do have a focus on behavioral health access, especially for our veteran communities and our adolescent communities, two of the communities which are the most challenging uh, to, to meet the need. Um, and uh, I'm very proud that in Maryland, um, Again, when we speak about local legislatures and, and the, the, the powerful role that local legislatures play, uh, many of the national policies uh, that, that are very, very popular, uh, we passed in Maryland at, at the state level, codifying, we codified the Affordable Care Act uh, policies in Maryland law. Um, we passed marriage equality before it passed nationally. Uh, we passed uh, capping the cost of insulin before it was, it was part of the, the, uh, the federal package. Um, and, uh, and just, just a, a couple more things about, you know, the importance of, 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 of voting local, um, is that, that there were, there were two, there were a couple of really important veto overrides. Um, of course, Maryland has, a, a majority, they have a democratic majority in, in, in both how, both chambers, but, um, but our margin for, uh, the veto override is, is still somewhat tight. And we have a number of battleground uh, delegates who are in you know, districts like mine where there is a broad range of ideologies. And often there is pressure to sort of um, uh, move your vote to center, to, you know, to, to be a little more centrist, um, to ensure that you are, you are um, uh, representing your, your whole constituency. And that's really important. But sometimes you have those moments where you really have to lean into your democratic values because it's the right thing to do. And we had two votes uh, that were um, 
were really important. And the veto override came from myself and one other battleground delegate um, where we voted knowing that given the historic nature of elections where you know, when you have one party in the White House, often um, you know, the, the, the uh, other chamber suffer in the House or the Senate. Um, same with, you know, at, at the state level, when you have one party in um, the governor's seat, sometimes you do lose seats at the, at the, um, uh, in the, in the House in the, in the House and the Senate. Um, so we knew that we might not get another opportunity. One of those was to ensure that our ITIN holders, those um, taxpayers who didn't necessarily have a social security number, also were eligible for COVID relief because COVID doesn't care. COVID doesn't care what your economic status is. You know, illness doesn't care about your immigration status. It, it, it doesn't care. Um, and these were, these were Maryland taxpayers and we couldn't let the national anti-immigration narrative um, stop us from making sure that our Maryland residents were taken care of. And, and the, other, um, the other override was um, another immigration policy. And I, 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 think, um, I think Congressman Brown spoke to this. I think um, Congressman Sarbane spoke to that, that, we, that we really have to fix the immigration policy at the federal level. But in the meantime, at the, at the state level, we don't want you know, a generation of, of young people sort of caught in the, in, in, in the crossfire. We don't wanna lose a generation of, of, of folks while we wait for a fix at, at the national level. And so, um, so we overrode a bill that actually provided, um, uh, provided uh, protections for, for our undocumented residents here in Maryland. Um, and I was very proud to cast that vote, even though I knew that that was a vote that might cost me an election. It was also a vote that was going to protect a lot of people. And that is the importance of, of, of really electing local representatives that are going to put the welfare of their constituents ahead of the politics of politics. Um, so I'll, 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 just, I'll just close there and say, you know, I, I, I'm a big proponent of, of voting the full ballot bottom to top. I know there's a question about how we can create greater access for voting in, in, um, in local elections. And, and obviously I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of, of that. I, I, I am a big believer in, in making it as easy uh, and accessible to vote as possible. Um, and, and, I, and I will just say that, that we have, you know, we have dual roles as legislators. Um, we have a role in creating good legislation and I, identifying those unintended consequences and ensuring that we're addressing them before we write the law, because it's so hard to, to you know, it's, it's so hard and time consuming to, to come back and fix it if you don't get it right. Um, and I see myself as a liaison to streamline the process that can, you know, most of the work that I do is actually in constituent services, not as much in, um, in legislation, because we are, we are a 90 day, uh, we're a 90 day legislature, and the rest of the time we're, we're just making sure we're meeting the needs of our constituents. But the other role we have as legislators is advocates. And we talk about speaking truth to power, and that's really, really important, but it's also important to speak truth about policy. And that is something that I have been very proud to do because often um, it can be difficult to talk about big, comprehensive, meaningful policy in sort of layman's terms and digestible bites. Um, and it's really important to use, you know, use the, 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 the pulpit that you have um, to speak truth about policy and to create a platform to, to, to move that needle and also make space for our future leaders. Um, I, and, this, and so uh, so I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak about the importance of, of, um, of the local legislature and, and making sure that, that we're voting that whole ballot. Thank you, Heather. I, <clears throat> we are running a bit over, so I don't think we have time for questions at the moment to make sure um, that we can uh, wrap up uh, here in a bit, but I'm really glad to hear that um, 
it, it sounds like you're open and you kind of answered the, que the question that we sent you, which was about um, people who are Maryland voters abroad and making sure that we're able to cast the ballots in, in the same um, the same issue that we had raised with um, candidate Miller for Lieutenant Governor. And I took and, notes and I'm <laughs> gonna reach out to Delegate Luthi. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's, I think it's, it, I'm really, I'm really happy that, um, you know, obviously looking forward to you winning your seat because I could tell, I could see people's heads nodding when you were explaining some of the things that it, it, being a liaison between the community and the state legislature is really important. And I, I can tell that you're, um, you have a lot of passion in being the person who connects the people to there to their legislature. Um, and it's been really great to have you. I'm, I'm glad that you were able to join us and I'm looking forward to talking to you, like I said, once I'm not in Sweden, once I am back in back in the States. Um, but yeah, thank, we don't, don't have time for uh, questions further, but really, really great, uh, great to hear you um, and to hear you talking about the local level of politics, which people who live abroad are a little bit more disconnected to than unfortunately we should be that's good to um and thank you so much and if you do have questions you you all have my my email and my contact information and i'm i'm happy to to uh happy to respond wonderful um yes and we will be glad to pass anybody uh who has questions to you if they can't get in touch directly <clears throat> so that being said i'm going to go ahead and pass it over to our final introducer and our final candidate uh, for uh, D to introduce Millicent Hall. Hello, can you all hear me okay? Yes. My name is D Langlois. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I had the great pleasure to be a resident of Maryland for about a decade and of Frederick County for about seven of those years where I was lucky enough to meet our next speaker, Millicent. Millicent grew up in a military family, which enabled her to live in a variety of states and even spend time in Germany as a very young child. She married her high school sweetheart, whom she met when she was 16. They have been married for 21 years and have two wonderful children who are 15 and 12. Millicent became politically active in 2014 and went on to become the vice president of the Women, Women's Democratic Lead of Frederick County, a board member of the United Democrats of Frederick County, a member of the Democratic Central Committee, an active member with Our Revolution and Frederick Progressives, which is where Beth and I had the extreme pleasure to meet and work with her, um, extending you know, engagement with everybody in the community across political lines. Uh, working on a variety of topics, including healthcare, which makes the next part kind of ironic because in 2018, we were all devastated when Millicent got very ill and had to step away from politics and her, her lack of presence was deeply felt. She spent a year in bed and then another year and a half in a wheelchair, but we are very glad that with hard work and some wonderful doctors and nurses, Millicent has been out of a wheelchair for a year and a half and is back to continue to fight for a better Maryland. Last year, Millicent opened up a board game store and became the first woman to run one in Frederick County history. Her store strives to be inclusive and I've heard great things from it from people we know in the area. And she continues to work with the Frederick Center and LGBTQ plus advocacy organization to offer a space cape a safe space to gain. Millicent has decided to run for delegate because she wants to take District 4 in a new and better direction. And we are very glad to see her take over that seat from a uh, one of our least favorite people in the State House. And we are very, very excited to get to vote for her in the upcoming election for a new direction in equality and civility. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to introduce my friend and colleague, Millicent Hall. Hi, everybody. Um, I am so glad to see Dee and Beth. You folks look great, and I'm uh, excited to 
actually be able to chat a little bit at some point. Um, so uh, everything they said on there is correct. I, I live in District 4, which is a very conservative district. Uh, however, when the redistricting happened, uh, what that did for us is it brought down the Republican advantage to below 10%. What that means is in a three person race, we have a chance to flip one seat. This has not been the case in decades. It is the first time, sorry, I'm hitting the table. <laughs> it's the first time in literally decades that we can have democratic representation in a very red part of Frederick County. How red you ask? The, the vacant seat is from Delegate Dan Cox, who is running for governor. That's how conservative District 4 is. Uh, it has been, in fact, at my youngest is now in middle school. And there was an incident where three middle schoolers at her school were arrested. One was charged when they had put threats against African American students and one uh, showing photographs of them with guns and one of them actually had a real gun the other two did their charges were dropped when they found out they were fake guns uh, but one of them actually had a real gun and that's where I live that's where my children go to school so my goal is to change that community if that's not who we are that's a small fraction uh, but we still need to work to strive for better uh, equality all across Maryland. We always think of Maryland as such a blue place, and it's not blue all over. And um, it, it doesn't even matter if it's blue. It just matters if it's fair, <laughs> if it's equitable, if it's doing its best to protect all of its people. And right now, I am not seeing the representatives in District 4 do that. I do own a board game store. In fact, I am actually here. Let's see if I can get, that's our dragon. <laughs> I'm trying to get him in the video. So I am actually at work. I have a more than a full-time job in addition to having to, I was actually going to put awesome children, but I thought maybe I should dial it back to great children. <laughs> and uh, I am also very different than a lot of other politicians. In 2014, I ran for the Board of Education. I made it through the primary uh, on actually on $100, which they were like, you can't do that. And and I did. People like to tell me I can't do things and I like to show them that you can. <laughs> but I did not win uh, my election. 2014 was a very rough year for Democrats. Uh, we lost so many seats here, in, including the one that I was running for. Uh, but I decided to stay active. Uh, I have a, my youngest has some special needs and I ran for Board of Education because I was so involved with the education system at that time. I've always been passionate about healthcare, but my healthcare journey took a completely different turn in 2000. 2018, and that gave me a completely new perspective on what needed to be done. I was also really glad to be invited to this panel uh, because I found out a lot of things I didn't know. I didn't know a lot of the challenges with voting that went on for overseas uh, citizens. I, I had no idea that that was a problem. To me, if we're in the state of Maryland and we can send out a uh, mail mail in ballots for free and the postage is free we should be doing that from everyone that is a citizen of maryland regardless of where you are that should just be how it is we can we know that the postal service can do things like have certified mail and we should offer that at no expense we should put as many opportunities to vote as we can and stop taking you know, stop putting up barriers uh, i'm also a very different kind of person when I ran in 2014. The number one complaint that I got after the election was that I was too honest, that I was supposed to say things a certain way. I wasn't supposed to, uh, I, when I went to a, a, a charter school forum, uh, every other candidate there when asked about the charter form laws uh, said that they wanted to, uh, change them and lessen them. And I was the only one who said, I like the laws, how they are in place, because uh, I felt like they protected students and uh, made sure that teachers were certified, that there was more equality in admissions, and all of those protections I felt were necessary for fair and open education, especially at a public charter school. Uh, but 
that went over like a lead balloon <laughs> in an audience where I actually had someone pull me aside afterwards and say, you're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to always agree with the people who are in the crowd, but I, I'm never going to do that. I'm always going to be who I am. In fact, uh, I was nervous about it. I actually called uh, Delegate Aruna Miller. Uh, we had met a couple times and I called her and I said, I am not like any of the other candidates. I was just like, I, I smile, I talk to everyone, I invite them to my board game store. <laughs> I, I bake cookies and I, I bring them places. And uh, I was just like, this isn't how the other politicians are. And she gave me some very good advice. And she said, don't change that. That's what makes you you. And that's what's gonna make me different in Annapolis is that I'm not in this political bubble. I'm a real person. At the store, we saw what happened. When gas prices went up, people stopped coming to game nights. We actually got messages from people saying, I live in my, Mount Airy, it's 40 minutes away, I can't afford the gas. And they just wanted to let me know what was happening to them. And that to me is, you know, it, it's a personal effect. These are people that have become my friends and watching them suffer under the effects of the economy has been really hard. And I wanna do my best to represent District 4 in a new and unique way. And I think the best way to do that is to listen to people. We're always being told how conservative District 4 is, but I think it's conservative by registration, not by people. I think the conservatives are uh, actually smaller than the number of Republicans that are here in the district, I hear people uh, when I'm out, they're not supporting Dan Cox. They think he's you know, crazy. They don't want him to win. And these are Republicans. They're looking for new voices. And I really believe that I can be that new voice. And I am the only candidate who has shown up to all of the pro-choice uh, movements and uh, protests here in Frederick County. Uh, at the delegate level, I've attended every single one because that is, to me, it's a right. We need to protect all people's rights. And that's what I'm gonna strive to do is really bring back equality and a sense of decency and civility uh, back to state government. Cause right now it's just so divided and we've forgotten to see people as people. And, uh, I would love to, if there's time, answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Millicent. Um, we, yeah, we definitely are running a little bit over yeah. and for, for people, uh, some people may have dropped off, um, but this is recorded for people who are watching in perpetuity. You can, you can, um, or watch a little bit later if, um, yeah, we've, we have this recording. It's on our Facebook live and, um, it will also be on YouTube, I believe. So um, with that being said, I do want to touch base at the very end to make sure people, again, know how to vote in Maryland so that we can vote for you and for everybody who's been speaking. And it the one question that we did have, it sounded like you addressed a little bit, which was about um, it, for ballot access and ease of voting for people who are Marylanders who, that vote abroad. Um, I, it sounded like you answered the question a little bit. So I didn't know if you wanted to speak to that one. And then I do wanna make sure that for everyone who's on and listening later, how we can get our ballots back if you have challenges, what you do about it. Um, so I didn't know if you wanted to say one quick thing really, really fast. And then I wanna make sure people know that important information. <laughs> what I will advocate for, I don't, this is not in place now, but what I would advocate for is that every voter who is living overseas should be able to send a ballot by certified mail at no cost. We offer mail-in ballots here in the state of Maryland to local residents at no cost. And we should extend that offer to our overseas residents as well. To me, it's just about a equity of access. And that's one of the important things. And I would 
like to say also, if you would like to find out more about my policies, you can go to millicentfordelegate.com and I've got a whole list of everything that I stand for and believe and I go into a little bit more detail on the specific things I would like to do. We, and definitely on our um, page for the candidates, we're gonna be sending out a message to people who have RSVP'd afterwards to make sure that they've got this link and all of the connections that they need. And we can share um, information about candidates in that message um, as well. But um, yeah, like I said, it, we are pushing it a little bit here and for people in Maryland, uh, especially where I am, I'm plus six, it's after 9 p.m. It's a little bit dark here. <laughs> um, so I wanted to, yeah, we can connect in terms of uh, more about policies. Thank you so much for joining and for sticking through. We've, again, like I said, we've gone over. Thank you, Millicent. Thank you to, I'm not sure if Heather is still on. And to every, all of our candidates who have been here with us today, taking the time uh, out aside from importantly their jobs their families the campaign all of these very important things to them and um yeah that thank you uh millicent for joining we're definitely going to be talking more and i want to do a really quick run through for everyone who's on and listening later how to vote and again just to remind people um very important dates and things to know when it comes to voting. Sorry, one second, my, it closed on me for some reason. Can everyone see my Adobe and I've got the actions to take now? Is that up if someone can thumbs up? Okay, so back to voting again. If you didn't catch this at the beginning, I talked about this way at the start of the call. We must return our ballots by postal mail, which means there are a lot of things to consider. Ballots start going out on September 24th. When you get your ballot, fill it out and mail it back right away. If you don't get it when ballots start going out, you want to contact your local election official in the county you vote in by email or phone. And if you don't reach them by email, by phone, to make sure that they'll send, they will send you yours. You can look up your contact information for your local election official in the county by going to votefromabroad.org backslash states backslash Maryland. You can also check your voting registration on the Maryland Voter Lookup page, which I have here, and I would be grateful if uh, that could be posted to the chat again so people can uh, take a look and make sure that their registration is set up. Please don't assume, like we heard from uh, Congressman Sarbanes, I believe, who said, um, we're not going to take anything for granted this year. We can't. So make sure you look it up. Registration deadline is Tuesday, October 18th. You can see on the screen the ballot request deadlines, which uh, by email or online, either or fax or postal mail, respectively. Those need to be postmarked by Tuesday, November 8th, and received by the election office on November 18th before 10 a.m. Please do keep these important dates in mind. You can also find them on votefromabroad.org. When it comes to races that will be on your ballot, federal versus state, all voters can vote for their U.S. representative and senator. You may also be able to vote for governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, et cetera. That depends on the category that you choose when you request your ballot. If you intend to return, you're eligible to vote in Maryland state elections. You don't have to have a set date, but you do have to have an intention to return. If your return is uncertain, you won't unfortunately be able to vote in state elections, but you can vote in the federal elections like U.S. House, House and Senate. Please also be aware that by selecting int I intend to return rather than my return is uncertain, it may be weighed in establishing residence or domicile with potential state tax or other implications. If you have unreliable postal service, you can check out the embassy, uh, i.e. the diplomatic pouch. Please, please be warned this can be slow and take, and take as long as four to five weeks to arrive back in the U.S. It is an option, but you do want to contact them ahead of time and make sure because they do sometimes have extremely limited windows when they'll accept ballots. We don't recommend using this after September is over. Also, we can express and courier mail service, uh, but it is it can be expensive. 
but uh, if regular mail or the diplomatic pouch is not available for you, you may want to look into a courier service. If you don't receive your ballot, easy thing, seems uh, you, you would be surprised, but you want to check your email spam or promotions folder if you requested your ballot by email. I found mine there. You might find yours there. Check your spam folder. And finally, the backup ballot. If you're concerned and that you may not receive your ballot in time to vote, to return your vote by the deadline, you don't have to wait. You can vote using the backup ballot, which is also known as the federal right in absentee ballot or the FLOB. More information on that can be found on the backup ballot. On the backup ballot can be found at www.votefromabroad.org backslash FAQS backslash BB1. And that is, and if you have other questions, you can always reach out to us at the Maryland State Team uh, at the email md at democratsabroad.org. One second, closing that. There are also opportunities for you to get involved with us. Like I said before, we at the Maryland State Team, you heard uh, Aruna Miller discuss it and a few others, legislation and the next legislative session is something that we're keeping in mind. We have a meeting for the Maryland State team coming up next Monday. That's at 1 p.m. Eastern. If uh, someone could post the link for that event into the chat, please do join us. We are getting started on that and planning to uh, take, you know, do what we can for planning ahead for that now. We're already uh, rolling into uh, the planning stage for that. Please do join us at that meeting or another one if you can't make that. And uh, for final wrapping up, I'm going to pass it back over to our state teams coordinator, Jennifer, to close us out for our, our a longer uh, event today than we expected, but it's been really, really great to hear from all of our candidates. And I hope you get a chance to watch this uh, later if um, you didn't get a chance to see everybody speak because I was really, really inspired and impressed. Jennifer. Awesome, thank you so much, Beth. It's go a little off script. These events are truly time consuming to plan and it's a lot of energy and a lot of effort. And every time we do it, we think going in, I'm so glad that we did this because hearing from these candidates is exactly why we're doing what we're doing, hearing what they have to say and hearing the battles that they're fighting for us on the ground and how they are working to improve the lives of people back home and our lives abroad. I mean, the, the willingness to work to improve the process of voting for Maryland voters. I mean, we heard that again and again and again, and that is, so inspiring and so critical to the work that we're doing here at Democrats Abroad. And so I'm just going to give a big shout out to Beth. Thank you so much for all of the work that you put into this. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks to the rest of the team. And really appreciate that you did this and that you organized and it didn't look like we were going to have eight candidates, but we did. <laughs> and I'm so thankful that we got to hear from all of them because they were all um, all had different perspectives and different ways that really motivated us to keep doing the work that we're doing. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for this opportunity. And, you know, it goes a little long. That's all good. <laughs> um, we appreciate all the effort that you put into this. And so thank you to the candidates who came and spoke to us today. And we just would ask that anybody listening consider becoming a volunteer with Democrats Abroad if you aren't already, because this is truly rewarding work and it is absolutely an all hands on deck moment. I mean, every single person helping to get out the overseas vote, because you heard how many people won their elections by the tiniest of margins. And that's us. That is us. Those are the mail ballots coming back at the end when they're going to need it again, especially this year. So please consider becoming a volunteer and also please consider making a donation to Democrats Abroad because that is how we reach more overseas voter. We use that advertising, we're phone banking, we're texting, we're mailing, doing all of these things to get out the vote. So thank you so much. And we look forward to helping keep Maryland blue and to winning these races and to being the margin of victory in this races. And with that, I will say thank you and 
good night or wherever you are. <laughs> Have a great day.